I want you to try pondering the power, the omnipotence, the all-powerful nature of a God who merely expressed a thought, speaks only one word, we would say, to effortlessly create a little science project called the universe. Didn't he, he didn't even get tired. He ceased from the work, but he didn't get tired from it. There is power in the Word of God. When he speaks anything, we better listen as though our lives depend on it, because it does. Consider the power of an all-holy God who can restore a sin-stained soul to a status of righteousness. Nothing is impossible with God. There is power in the spoken word or will of God. If not guided by the light of truth, we are left to ignorantly, foolishly die in darkness. And Paul's words in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 boldly remind Christians about the power and importance of God's gospel truth. The message of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 contain in a nutshell all the significance of the core events of what we call the gospel. It is God's power to save us. The mere human voice, what people say, not only leads to confusion, but also condemnation. I like Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23 in the context we know well, but... He says, O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in humankind to, who walks to direct his own steps. We're designed to need God and his guidance. Therefore, Proverb, Proverb chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him in all your ways, and he shall direct your paths. Well, part of our very design to, to permanently lean upon the Lord is to perpetually listen to His Word. That's how we do it. That's how we are guided along this life, by His spoken Word. Earth, if you haven't noticed, is a dark and evil place, not by God's creation. Of course, everything He made was great, but because of the sin that has infiltrated this world and our souls has contaminated it outside of Christ, it's a dangerous place to travel through on our way to heaven. And I take, of course, my eternity very seriously, so I'm very careful to let every step my heart takes be guided or navigated by the instructions of His Word. Psalm chapter 119, verses 105. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Many of you lost power over the last few days, and we can relate to what it's like to then use our phones or a flashlight to, to guide every step that we take so we don't hit what we think we're already familiar with. I thought that chair was somewhere else. No, it's right there. And we'll just keep on talking. I didn't expect that sound. And we're moving on. But Psalm 119, we can see so many times when you look at this verse, you see that there's a lamp and then it's next to a Bible. But no, in this case, I'm glad I found this picture because the Bible is the illuminate, uh, illuminating light of truth that guides our path. And it does many things. Let's review some things that His Word has the power to do for us even today. Number one, it has the power to convict of sin. How would you react if you were told that you killed a now resurrected God and you were influenced by Greek mythology? Oh, you'd be thinking, there is no hope for me. But it was indeed our sins that put Christ on the cross. So in a way we did. But our sins led to his crucifixion and that very death, that very resurrection is why we have hope. That's the very reason we have hope. Peter had the honor of preaching the first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2. And when we get to verse 37, now when they heard this, they were what? Cut to the heart. Oh, no. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They heard the gospel. And then they heard how to respond to it. But the news of God's sacrifice pricked their hearts to those who had the very hearts of those who had crucified God in flesh. And when we face the um, truth about Christ, and when we come to the 
acknowledgement of our own guilt that put Christ there, there can only be one of two responses. One is contempt, and that would lead to rejection. Or the other one is conviction, that leads to repentance. God's Word, God's Word still has the power to convict any soul who chooses to hear it. Our job certainly is to share it. I'm thankful that my salvation doesn't depend on people's acceptance or rejection because God gives the increase and I better share that message. But if you hear it or reject it, that's on you. If you accept it, then the, the glory is mutually shared, no doubt. But I am so thankful that good hearts, still touched by the gospel, have the power to be saved by it. Souls are lost. God's word must be taught. Another devotional message, what does the gospel plan have the power to do? To regenerate. I like that word, regenerate. What does that mean? Synonyms include the word renewed, recreated, reborn. 1 Peter 1, 23 says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word which lives and abides forever, the word contains the power of eternal life. The word contains the power of eternal life. Not the ink on the paper, but the message of the God behind it. Incredible. The soul that feeds on this truth, this gospel truth, can be renewed, recreated, and eternally sustained. That's power. That is power. James chapter 1 verse 18 says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. What does it mean, first fruits? That's a strange term, and there are a lot of teachings from it. And we can think about our own resurrection at his return for sure, yeah. We can also consider how by his resurrection and the truth that it validated of what he taught, we become more like Christ every day, our spiritual rebirth in baptism that starts right there by water and of the Spirit, and we grow thereby. John chapter 3, verse 5, that's the essence of Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. And I love that conversation in all of its uh, faithful portrayals. This is the essence of when Jesus said, it's the spiritual life. It's not about getting more. It's not about getting different. It's about becoming brand new. And I mean all new. What has the power to totally change your attitude, your perspective, your habits, your behaviors, your desires, your beliefs, your ethics, your decisions, your conversations, your conduct, on and on we could go. What has the power to do all of that? The power of God's Word. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. The knowledge of God through His Word is really all we need to both know Him and to righteously live before him. This idea was complimented in class, and let's notice again verse 4. Thereby we have exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the, the corruption that is in this world through lust. What has the power to do that? The word of God. Now there's a lot of, there are a lot of contextual points to 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and 7, but a few good points that can be brought out is that God, we're reminded that only God has the power to regenerate our souls. He has the power, and by faith we contact it. But the new life of the gospel, what is this? He says, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. That new life in us comes by our faith in what? His word and everything that he has said. And I was thinking about how there are a lot of scriptures today that I'll reference. Half of it will be reading, half of it will be short devotional points. And even though I'm not old school preaching, I am old school conditioned, and that's my roots. And back in the day, you say one point, you, you substantiate it with 25 verses. And back in the day, they used to handwrite verses, usually in red ink. That was just a thing. And the phrase is, if, you, if by the time your lesson is done, if it's not dripping red, rewrite it. Put a lot of scripture in there. And that's what we're doing. Folks, this is interesting. The Word of God, the gospel plan of salvation, also has the power to produce faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by God's Word. You know, I think about truth. The nature of any truth is either accepted or rejected based on the darkness or light in a person's heart. 
right? I've always had the desire to want to know objective truth outside of me so that I don't, you know, just listen with a filter. I want to know truth. And so not all who hear the gospel will respond. But life is to those who choose upon hearing to not only uh, to receive and to believe. Honest hearts who hear the word examine it. They gain confidence in it. And then they eventually uh, develop a devotion to it, a lifelong commitment. And that's the power of hearing gospel truth, is that it can completely redirect a person's life and destiny. That is power. Acts chapter 16, verses 30 through 33. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? And so they said, Believe on the Lord. That means everything he is and has said. Believe on the Lord and follow him and you will be saved, it says. You and your household. And then they proceeded to speak the truth about Jesus. Tell me the truth to believe. Tell me the truth to obey. And that's what, uh, is a, what uh, transpired. The truth was taught, it was heard, it was received, it was then instantly acted upon. And the result is that new life. I love the reference to John chapter 17, again verse 20, pray for all those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus, yes, himself was praying for himself, but praying as well for you both to hear and to receive and follow the word of, of him and to effectively share it with others. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Jesus did many other signs which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may always believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have that life in his name. So don't be distracted from this book. It's what you need. Have you ever needed something you really didn't want, but you did it anyway and you're glad you did? Open this book. Read it. Feast upon it. Don't let your eyes be blurred or your ears dulled when, uh, or deafened when its pages are open and when its word is being spoken. It is the source that builds faith that brings up. Very interested to bring up this point to cleanse. We don't think about this too much, but it has the power to cleanse. Paul makes an inspired parallel you heard in class as well that we learn a lot from. There's one metaphor where Christ says, well, the, Jesus by, the Spirit says by inspiration through Paul that Christ is the groom and the church is the bride. Godly wedding scenes are so beautiful, aesthetically, spiritually. It is so special to see a bride and groom, a man and a woman ready to make the commitment to enter the covenant of marriage and to grow and to let that relationship reflect the love that is between Christ and his church. So beautiful to see that. To gain more appreciation for what Christ has done, and as we study our roles within the marriage, imagine yourself, because we all are like this, man or woman, we are all like this. Imagine yourself as a destitute, poor, impure, rejected woman who only dreams of being a righteous wife but has no glory of her own to offer. Just imagine that sometime. Because that's where we were outside of Christ before our baptism, before our wedding ceremony to Christ in baptism, our wedding garments were shameful, tattered and torn, sin-stained, saturating every garment. We were too ashamed for, our, for the hopeful groom to even see us. What would he want? What would a holy God want with someone like me, right? But then imagine your soul breaking out in, in rapturous joy when you hear impossible news that the groom has chosen you. What? Me? We may not even be able to fathom that, but, but your instant, and yes, instant deep appreciation would then fuel that loyalty, and especially when you hear somehow that, that his love for you is so much that he's laying his life down for you, and that by this pure intense sacrifice of love, he is somehow able to cleanse your very name and soul, regenerate you and cleanse you from scarlet to spotless white, 
tell me how that can happen. How can I be a worthy bride? By following his word. You know, we, we hear Ephesians chapter 5, 25, uh, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 so often. And we don't often hear this. But after everything I've already said, it may mean a lot more to us. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for. There's the sacrifice. Gave himself for that he might do what? Sanctify, set apart cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church that she should be holy and without blemish the relationship that relationship should be seen within between terry and i of course in our marriage and christ demonstrated that love for his church through sacrifice in and i was, I was told this years before i even knew terry really and, and i was told that there's no place in the marriage for selfishness. It's lethal. Well, you hear that, but when you're living a bachelor life, doing what you want, when you want, if you want, how you want, well, you, you hear it, you know it, but you really don't understand it until in that experience, right? At least by experience, you don't know it. You can know it's true, but not how to apply it. But then if selfishness is lethal, then sacrifice is life-giving. And so likewise, husbands offer their lives in sacrificial service to their wives. We don't often teach humble leadership the society sure doesn't, but God's word has always been different. What's all this about? The gospel, the word, its own spiritual guidance is the cleansing power. Christians who follow their Savior's spiritual guidance are a glorious bride indeed. And it's a beautiful compliment. Back about two or three years ago when we had a marriage uh, topic in our quarter series, some of you said, boy, you, you were uh, disproportionately hard on the men. When you're going to balance it out later with the women? I said, not necessarily. No, nope, no. Nope. Because we husbands are told to be like Christ. And if we are, it's a lot, a lot easier for the wives to be like the church. We have a tremendous responsibility. We all do. But we are then, if we follow Christ by his word, kept cleansed, presentable, beautifully radiant, and <laughs> by faithfully following his word. Great message great devotional thought but the word has the power to do many other things that we love it has the power to build up acts chapter 20 verse 32 brethren i commend you to god and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up the concept is a house that's being structured and erected fortified and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified a building needs a sure foundation doesn't it well god's word is a sure foundation to build your eternity up on and when you do, it guarantees a few things. The Word of God guarantees growth. It guarantees development. Yes, compensation, reward, award, achievement, and eternal promotion. We could go on. There's a lesson right there. But all of this is a process. So, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 and 7. Also for this very reason, give all diligence to add to your faith virtue knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. We can grow in these spiritual traits by daily consumption of the Word. That's power. 1 Peter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word to grow by it. What else can the power of the Word of God do? It can make me wise. <laughs> Not just full of knowledge and trivia. I actually don't like Bible trivia. There's a lot of facts in there I don't yet know. I don't like to play that game, quite frankly. But I do want to understand how I'm supposed to live. And that means study every day. God is omniscient, and the Bible is from Him. Think about that. God is omniscient, the Bible is from Him. Yes, He can write a book that we can understand, but the points I mentioned just then doesn't mean that after you read it all you'll you'll know everything it just means that you have everything you need to know to live righteously before him and to grow as you should that's beautiful and if that's the case we would not be surprised to see the Bible making that claim of itself Psalm 119 130 says your words give light and understanding to the simple I want to know all those words. And 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 makes this claim that everything, all of inspired scripture is in fact God-breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness that you and I in Christ can have all that we need for every good work. 
Incredible. And only the power of, of God's divine truth can make that claim and it be proven, testified, verifiable. The power of the Word of God gives assurance of salvation. Assurance of salvation. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Anyone who expresses doubt that we can know has just told you they haven't studied 1 John long enough to understand it. Direct them to 1 John. Help them in that critical stage in their life because we can know intellectually and experientially that we are saved in Christ. And if you stay in the Word, essentially it's saying if you stay in the Word, you can kick out the doubt. We can bring peace or the power, we can feel the peace from the power of God. It brings peace. Psalm 85, verses 6 through 8. I will hear what the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. In a world of confusion, in a world of chaos and condemnation, divine peace, that divine joy you already heard about is so priceless. And it's only in Christ. His word comforts his word, strengthens his word, um, relaxes our souls, knowing that we are on the winning side of eternity. All these verses, let's, we can summarize them if you want to read them on your own time. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 speaks of Christ being King of kings and Lord of lords. In Revelation 3, 5, it speaks of his followers being more than conquerors because they're redeemed in Christ and walking faithfully. Beautiful. Uh, let's reverse this order. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who, are, who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 38 says, There is no threatening power that can remove our place in his kingdom. All that God has done and all that God promises to do, he has a 100% track record. He's going to fulfill his promises for us. All of this results in us having eternal life that nothing can take away. And that truth gives us priceless peace. Number nine, the power of the word can bring joy, can bring comfort and hope. In the midst of Israel's darkest time when Babylon was taking them over and the temple being destroyed in that sense, Life would never be the same for the children of Israel. And Jeremiah yet found joy and strength and hope from no other source than but from the word and the promise of God. Chapter 15, verse 16. Your words were found and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. He would have some tough times, yes. But that is always the case. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. God calls us through his word as well. No matter, no matter if nations fall, standing on the word, being his child, affords genuine cause to rejoice. The power of the word has the power to protect. Protect from what? Well, error and protect from sin. Errors from others who try to mislead you, sometimes ignorantly, sometimes willfully. It's hard to believe as you read Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 32, that there would be people who willingly teach what they know is not true just to mislead souls to hell. I can't fathom that. But then 2 Peter 3, 13 through 15 says this, Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them and that from the childhood you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ doctrines of men will not save you only God's truth can be counted on I like Psalm 119 11 your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not, what, sin against you. I don't want to sin against God, so I've got to stay in this word and make sure it's what I live by. It's what I live and breathe and see every moment of the day. It's in my heart, and I've already predetermined to live by it so that when it complements, the, the truth complements my desire in my heart, God's will can be seen in almost every situation that you see as you mature is the key. 
But hold to God, heed His word, your life depends on it. In conclusion, I'd like to read, uh, in this case, just John chapter 12, verse 48, 49, and 50. John chapter uh, 12, verses 48 through 50. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken my own authority, no, but the Father who sent me gave me a command which I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. The power of the word is so serious that Jesus himself says this has come from the Father. And for those who reject it, it will be their judge. I don't want the word to judge me. It condemns me. I want to follow Christ and be purified by the word so that I can have eternal life and have that wedding ceremony, that baptism, renewal, recreation, cleansing in the waters of baptism by faith in the blood of Christ that saves us. Next week, we'll focus on the power of that blood as we complement our class series as well. But if you want to access this power that still has the ability to save your soul and cleanse you and give you eternal life and joy upon this earth, blessings only in Christ, let's make it happen as we stand and as we sing.